Hey everybody, my name's Democracy, and I want to welcome you back to our series ranking the Soulsborne boss difficulty. Wait a minute, that's not right. Oh yeah, HD baby, look at those jiggle physics. I'd let Thomas stockpile my... Hello everybody, and welcome to a boss ranking I'm thrilled to revisit. It's been four years since we did our initial trounce through the Soulsborne bosses. It feels weird to say, after all that time, that Demon Souls, the genesis of the franchise, is by way of remake its most graphically impressive offering. Other bits and bobbles like teleporting between archstones, transporting excess baggage to Thomas from afar, and a whole range of ridiculous animations provide quality of life changes into a game now bursting with it. Outside of these changes, the game at its core remains faithful to the original. A few small gripes notwithstanding, Demon Souls Remake stands tall as not only the definitive version of the game, but arguably the best to hold the Souls moniker. Unparalleled linear level design with difficulty crescendos split across five distinct worlds, a thick, dreamlike atmosphere ripe with nightmarish twists, inventive mechanics like world tendencies shifting the land into light or darkness with adaptive difficulty and special events, and of course, a roster of unforgettable bosses, for better or worse. Demon Souls being FromSoft's first foray into their boss canvas resulted into some of the most outlandish ideas to date. The catch is, many of these concepts revolve around discovering a fatal weakness that, once discovered, trivializes what might otherwise seem like a titanic threat. Sometimes this is based in tricking day-to-day -day eye, others utilizing Demon Souls' many, many powerful tools, and every now and again a boss's one-dimensional nature is purely its demise. This is important to keep in mind as I rank the difficulty of these bosses from my sole perspective, something I never did as the original was community based, also noting that I've played Demon's Souls many times, making this a veteran perspective. If you were hoping to see my thoughts on boss quality, stay tuned for something creative up my own sleeve in the video essay vein. On that note, please enjoy my one and only ranking of the Demon's Souls remake bosses. Number 18, True King Alon. The Boiled Turd of Balataria remains the easiest boss to FromSoft's name. With buttery smooth 60 frames and improved animations, it's easier than ever to spin circles around this farce of a monarch. He'll make every attempt to hurl his pathetic husk at you, but even if it were to land a hit, it's nothing you can't heal through with time to spare. When considering other legendary buttercups like Pinwheel and Witches of Hemwick, True King has a distinct advantage. Those bosses can pose at least a slight threat if you choose to fight them early on in your playthrough. Alant, on the other hand, must occur at the very end of every playthrough, assuring you'll be more than prepared to hyper-stomp his preachy ass. You have to actively try to lose to the true king. It may make thematic sense for the story's surprise conclusion, but it doesn't make for any sort of notable difficulty. Number 17, Leechmonger. This grotesque infestation is the first boss where game knowledge plays a role in his ranking. First, there's absolutely no way I'm going to the Valley of Defilement earlier than necessary. Considering my build required exactly nada from the bothersome swamp, I intentionally left this archstone for last. While Demon Souls may have five linear sprawling worlds, their succession isn't created equal. Classic wisdom would suggest you barrel your way through level 1, then level 2, and so on. In Demon Souls, the five archstones are broken into segments divided by bosses, each division being commonly referred to in parts. For example, the Valley of Defilement is the fifth archstone, with Leechmonger as its first guardian to further exploration. Defeating him unlocks a new archstone checkpoint, marking the start of a whole new area. One of the best in the series, mind you. With progression to the third area being blocked by another boss we'll be seeing soon. The first area is referred to as 5-1, the first part of the fifth archstone, then 5-2, and finally 5-3. Every world is divided in this manner, simple enough. What isn't immediately intuitive based on gaming intuition is that, in terms of difficulty, the first part of each world is easier than the second part of any world. To state it more plainly, 1-2 will be harder than 3-1 for your average player, in theory at least. What makes it even more complicated is the way Demon Souls designs its levels. Enemies in each archstone have one or more distinct weaknesses for you to capitalize on, if you can figure them out that is. To obtain these Achilles heels, you'll need to make an active decision which worlds you're willing to take your lumps on. Want the Dragonbone Smasher like I did? You'll need to beat the entirety of World 2, which as you'll later see, has some of the game's harder bosses. Want an easy weapon to demolish each of its first parts? Grab the Crescent Falchion early in 4-1, oh, but mind the relentless skeletons that block its approach. 
All of this is to say, the initial levels you choose are likely to be the most challenging as you work toward a build, veteran or not. Even if you know the game like the back of your hand as I do, the lack of initial soul levels and resources can make early levels brutal. Bosses on the other hand tend to have weaknesses as I mentioned, either built into their design or through the levels they guard. Leechmonger, for example, is quite weak to fire. Conveniently, there's a woman begging for you to buy her wares, including an extra powerful fire resin. Demon Souls is ripe with inner level hints like this to help you intuitively discover its easier paths. So imagine me hating the fifth archstone, intentionally leaving it for last when my build is complete. Fully upgraded weapons, stocked to the brim with resin, heading through to pay Leechmonger a visit. Can you guess the result? He got wrecked. No matter the build I go for, it's incredibly rare I fight Leechmonger early. Even if I do, his mechanics are relatively simple. You can fight from range with great arena design giving you a perch, or get up close and roast him. All that's important is that you have fire or strong tools, both being a bonus. Fire is easily accessible as shown, making him easy even early if you're in the know. None of his attacks hit particularly hard, making it easy to chomp on grass in his face, and though he leeches your health away by coating you in them, he'll be dead before it matters. Apologies for the extended segue, but it's important to understand as we move forward. Game knowledge is huge in any Souls game, but it's particularly significant in Demon Souls, as is the order in which you choose to fight the bosses. With my own chosen route, Leechmonger is also a joke, but even when facing him early, readily available fire and the lack of potent offense makes him a solid punch line all around. Number 16, Dirty Colossus. Leechmonger's filthy cousin is proof that this family is full of squishy garbage. Six hits instead of three, bugs instead of leeches, burn them off in the torches around the arena, or inhale grass and burn them first. He'll spray bugs, AoE blast with them, and give you a hearty swing. In contrast to Leechmonger, it's highly unlikely players will make it through 5 too early unless they really want Maiden Astraea's soul. If you did, Leechmonger's damage would be potent enough to pose a threat, but his defenses are still easily roasted. While I appreciate the concepts, the Swamp Duo is easy and creatively lackluster compared to the rest of the boss roster. Number 15, Old Monk. For those who aren't familiar, Old Monk is the half-light of Demon Souls. The Archdemon throws his robes headfirst onto a black phantom thrall controlled by an invading player. Mileage here will clearly vary based on player skill, but I'm only going on my sole playthrough of Remake so far, and I'm just gonna let that fight play out. Latency, ability for me to snack on grass ad nauseum had it been needed, and way too strong of an R2 pancake for a boss fight. I love the concept, but this experience will be so hit or miss. I honestly felt bad for the player boss because they must have waited ages to get lag pancaked. I know because I was trying to get summoned afterward and I was in a mob of white phantom hopefuls for over 30 minutes without ever being chosen. It's a shame my fight was so one-sided. In the off chance you decide to fight the offline version, expect it to be just as easy, if not more so, considering you can take advantage of baitable AI. This is hard to give a permanent rank, but based on this sole battle, there were standard enemies that put up more of a fight than this. Number 14, Maiden Astraea and Garl Vinland. Maiden Astraea is like a piece of your favorite cake while at a birthday party on a diet. There's pressure to join in and eat it, you want to eat it, but then you see a dude wielding a giant hammer blowing his load all over it and you think to yourself, I'm definitely eating that cake, just try to stop me old man. Okay, maybe it's not a perfect analogy. Said in less idiotically cryptic terms, killing Maiden Astraea is never a joyous experience despite the need to do so. The methods of defeat, while easy, also feel particularly savage. Shoot her from afar while her honorable knight watches in horror unable to defend her, or square up and show him who the real Pancake Master is. Based on the original, I really expected more from him. He blasted off a few spells at a distance to look menacing, then came in and took his medicine no better than Leechmonger. Astraea herself won't even fight you in the case you beat Vinland. She ends it herself, defenseless. A somber end that is the only act to make you question what drives you to slay these demons as you head toward the game's end. Mechanically, it may not be the most exciting in terms of sheer complexity, but it cinematically sets a chilling tone unlike most other bosses in the game. And unlike the bosses so far, I can at least see a path to demise with a stray slam from Vinland or falling into the plague baby pit. 
Still not nearly enough to break out of the bottom five. Number 13, Adjudicator. Much like Astraya, though there is certainly a path to failure if you stay up top and get tongue guzzled by this megaton of lard, Adjudicator is a surprising pushover for his stature. This boss is all trick based on thick. Try to hit his girth and you'll be sorely disappointed. Instead, aim for the bird on his head. Whether you do this from above with ranged attacks or smack the open wound to make him topple, he takes insane damage. Especially if you left 4-1 for later, which many will thanks to the unyielding skellies. Now, the setup for his trick would leave room for you to get squashed if it weren't for the slowest windup in Boletaria. You could let the rest of this video play out in the time it takes that bloated arm to swoop down. His only saving grace in Remake is that the offhand weapon can help deflect melee attacks to his wound, but it doesn't matter when you have eons to get behind his only close range attack. He's an appropriate sigh of relief to end one of the game's hardest levels, handily earning him a lower end knock. Number 12, Phalanx. Like True King, Phalanx has only grown easier in Remake. What was previously a pile of shielded graphical mush with hard to read spears flying outward is now crystal clear in Remake. Similar to Leechmonger, the level readily drops loads of firebombs and fire resin, seemingly more than the original, making it a cinch to blow a path to the boss itself. Seriously, you get enough firebombs to KO almost all the hoplites with haphazard tosses. After bombarding the bulk of the formation, slap some fire resin on your weapon and carve through what's left. I love the concept of an archer boss hiding behind a phalanx of soldiers only to be defenseless in close combat. It's not that much of a challenge, but I do enjoy the punching bag after 1-1, which can be a brutal trial for beginners and veterans alike, unless you went royalty. Number 11, Old Hero. This oaf has a huge weakness, Thief's Ring. A ring with reverence in Demon Souls along with a Kling Ring, giving you more HP in soul form, the Thief's Ring makes it harder for enemies to detect you. This includes the range at which they become aware of your presence, a range that, when mixed with Old Hero's lack of sight gimmick, becomes essentially up his butt. Walk up, smack him a few times, run away as he slams and throws a fit, rinse and repeat until he's dead. He does hit extremely hard if you do slip up, his combos are often deadly if caught, and the fight is harder without the thief ring. But considering how easily accessible it is in 1-1, you're handicapping yourself if you don't use it. In the event you don't, you can still do the hit and run tactic, you just need to use the full length of the arena to hide at a distance so he loses your trail. His only real advantage is how hard he hits. Though he's more likely to land a blow than Adjudicator, it's not by much. Number 10, Storm King. Where Old Hero and Adjudicator's gimmicks are debatably a flop, or at the very least one-dimensional once you know what they are, Storm King takes a creative fight and runs in a replayable direction with it. No matter what your build, you are equally prepared to take this fight on. Unless you use magic or the sticky compound longbow, in which case you'll demolish it. Running amidst the now gorgeous storm and swelling music to grab a wind-laden blade and split the heavens asunder is magical. There's an actual flow to the battle in phases, with ad killing to prove yourself worthy of the king's attention, sweeping overhead damage windows, hiding and dodging the many ranged onslaughts, and keeping opportune placement to sink the most blows possible. Making the blade take your full stamina bar was wise to prevent ease of spam, but it has a serious punch and animation to make up for it. It's a great fight made incredible in Remake, but I can't say it's particularly difficult. As I've mentioned, Remake made projectiles much easier to see and therefore handle. Hiding from the King's area assaults now is child's play. The only danger comes from crowd control with his baby rays, but they're easily healed through at this stage of the game. Storm King is a blast, but he's not breaking any difficulty charts. Number 9, Fool's Idol. Pinwheel's mother has the edge on him in both quality and difficulty, though perhaps not by much. In fact, you may be shocked to see Fool's Idol this high on the list. It's in part thanks to how easy the first half of the list is, but credit where it's due, she can catch you slipping without a keen eye. Though pillars help guard against her gimmick of spawning clones that shoot magic, identifying the real idol that suits the larger soul arrow is now harder from certain angles due to the grandiose magical effects. Repositioning to get a better view not only exposes you to half a dozen magic blasts, you're at risk of getting caught in one of her traps. These are laid each time she disappears after a brief attack window, but visually disappear quickly. Whether due to poor memory or unlucky positioning of the real idol, melee builds will have a tough time making it to her without taking heavy punishment. 
The catch is you can heal through it with enough HP, so it's very dependent on build and how late in the game you face her. In the mid game with a melee build, she wasn't anything overwhelming, but she put up far more resistance than anything on today's list so far. Oh, and if you're new, do yourself a favor and slay this liar beforehand. If you don't, she'll respawn forever, making it impossible to win. Number 8, Tutorial Vanguard. Fool's Idol truly is a turning point for the difficulty, marked by a boss that precedes everything on the list so far in terms of game progression by appearing in the tutorial. Please note that I did not consider his appearance in 4-1 for this list. Without even considering the mechanics, Vanguard has two advantages no other boss has. You get only a single attempt per playthrough, and your healing resources are finite based solely on what you found in the tutorial. Finally, along with only Phalanx, you can't attempt to bypass difficulty through boosting your soul level. It's do or die in one shot, sometimes literally with the power Vanguard hits with. Your experience here will differ dramatically based on the starting class you choose, but no matter what, Vanguard has bodacious HP to match that bot. Speaking of his stature, the golden rule still applies. Smack that booty. If you want a tip for Vanguard, always walk to your left around his hip. This soul technique will help you avoid every attack other than his butt slam, which is well telegraphed and places you perfectly behind him to take advantage. The last thing you want to do is square up with him. His attack cone is massive and has insane stagger. Really, that's all there is to his ranking. With patience, walking around and booty smacking will claim victory. It's doing so without any slip-ups over an endurance battle with limited resources that makes what would otherwise be a notable challenge worthy of a spot in the top half. Number 7, Tower Knight. This is yet another boss where knowing the trick to beating it is vital. Ankle biting isn't necessarily easy, but it does make the fight less daunting to have a target, especially when you know your first target should be the eight archers around the arena. Tower Knight can fire soul arrows at you while above, but the majority of the upper area is shielded from these attacks, making cleanup easy so you can move on to the main event. Tower Knight will stomp, slash at afar, jump back, and do a close up or large wound up slam that creates an AoE around it. Your task is to slash not one, but both heals. It's easier than ever to swap back and forth with clear visual indicators, but I found that Tower Knight was able to land blows on me more easily until I adjusted to their timing. The key is running between his legs and staying behind him at all times, while always maintaining stamina for a getaway. No matter how you get him down, his head takes dramatically more damage. I was happy my fight ended up taking two knockdowns to keep it interesting, and I loved getting used to his similar but new animations that caught me off guard a few times. Not exceptionally difficult, but kept me on my toes far more than any bottom dwellers. Number 6, Dragon God. I had hoped that Dragon God might be better in Remake. I wasn't expecting a full revamp, I just wanted better than getting a giant fist up my ass at the slightest mistake. Well, pucker Uranus, because the only change in Remake is visual obscurity making the initial difficulty even harder. Maybe it's because I've done the previous version so many times, but I always found the pillars you need to hide behind to be very well defined. They're wide enough to leave no question, you're hidden. It took me multiple deaths in Remake to figure out where I needed to hide to avoid his gaze. To know you're safe, you need to watch his eyes. Yellow equals hidden, red equals hide or die. If you take longer than a few seconds, he roars, signifying your doom. The path to each safe spot is guarded by rubble that you must break, but often the animation to break it takes too much time, making it unsafe to move to the next spot. Figuring out what is safe and what isn't feels more like trial and error, which is particularly annoying when a single error forces you to start all over. The second half is the same, but the rubble is more spread out. Any hope of dodging the first is squashed as he swaps to raise in the ground at the sight of you. Once you pin him down with both ballistas, it's a few uppercuts between his hot dragon breath to end it. There's a solid chance that subsequent fights will be cleaner with a better idea of the safe spots, but I still find the margin for error in this fight to be significantly higher than most of what comes before. That's enough to earn this disappointing dragon a spot just outside the top five. Number 5, Penetrator. This is the birth of the Soulsborne Night Fight. It feels way too good seeing that pig get skewered to warm up his blade. Fortunately, he'll be attempting to unleash it on us and it lives up to its visual splendor. Penetrator is a very rhythmic fight, with early tells leading to delayed spin attacks that cover a full 360 cone around him. He has variable versions of these slashes to throw you off, a charge, and his ultimate penetrator that hurts really, really bad if it hits. 
His downfall is being locked behind two things, beating at least one arch demon and one of the game's more challenging levels riddled with red eye knights. Seriously, what were they thinking with these no cooldown charge attack chains? Look at that! Endurance doesn't exist for enemies, I guess, but I digress. These factors suggest you're likely to be fairly well leveled with a growing build as you make your way to face the king. This unfortunately makes Penetrator more of an appetizer, even if he has brilliant flashes in his short stay. And though I wouldn't consider summons for his placement, if you did bring along Bjor, you're basically playing whack-a-mole while he tanks for you. Still worth a solo top 5 knock. Number 4, Armored Spider. I can't believe after all these years that Armored Spider's hitbox is his penis. I always thought you were hitting the face, but it turns out his weakness is his wang. Relatable. Add Armored Spider to the club of being made a bit easier by more clearly defined animations. I particularly love that his old Omega Boom is translated into an oil spit and fire shit spread back to the wall. It forces you to deal with coming to the front of the tunnel, which can be hit or miss. If the spider's attacks miss you, great, but if you get hit, you might stagger into stun lock hell, especially if you get webbed. Getting in close isn't some instant reward either. The spider instantly swaps to close up melee, which can be seriously awkward to roll through, both due to fast tells and janky animations pushing you away from your target. Attack windows are mildly generous, especially on the slam, but you need to monitor your stamina to dodge what comes next as there is little mercy once he recovers. It does appear the back spot is still safe for arrow spam, but I won't rank based on cheese I didn't participate in. It's taken me years to finally understand all of Armored Spider's mechanics and timings, and even after all that time, it remains one of Demon's Soul's hardest challenges. Number 3, Flame Lurker. The leap to the final three is massive, with Flame Lurker leading the charge in as chaotic of a shit show as ever. His lunges, erratic jumpbacks, explosive punches, and slams are potent to a terrifying degree. Particularly noticeable was the chip damage you would take from coming into contact with it. It might seem minor, but it really added up over the course of the fight. What really throws this fight on its head is the inconsistent behavior. It's never completely clear where your safe windows are, but there are a few things you can do that make Flame Lurker more manageable. First, take advantage of him being stunned when you hit him. Just plan to keep enough stamina for a getaway. Second, use pillars to get reprieve even when he is swiggity swooty all over you. This is a valuable time to spam high end grasses to keep your health high, which is important considering his high damage. Finally, slap sticky white stuff on your weapon. Oh wait, no, they changed the name. And what I can only assume was an attempt to make it sound less loot. No. No, there's no way that was their intention. The important thing is Flame Lurker is weak to magic like most enemies in Demon Souls, so pick it up at the beginning of 2-1 and slap that goop on any weapon to become a magic powerhouse. There's enough in your favor mixed in with my own experience fighting Flame Lurker to keep him from the top spot, but make no mistakes, this juggernaut's place in the top 3 is well deserved. Number 2, False King Alant. If there's any fight outside of Storm King that received a quality boost in the remake, it's False King Alon. Notable since he was already one of the best bosses in the original. If Penetrator is the prototype for night type bosses we love, False King Alon is ground zero for the goats that Miyazaki has since created. A tense buildup that comprises the entire journey, a menacing cutscene to draw the battle, a slow cold walk that is a prelude to mad dashes, wind slashes, and effects that amplify every bit of Alant's kit. When you break it down, most of what he does are varied sword combos, some with wind flying horizontally or vertically. That said, his variety is the most complex of any enemy in the game. He has other tricky mechanics like his charged blast that he must be stunned out of, a scary animation that normally would scream get away from me and is sure to catch players off guard guard, and he can even steal the souls out of you. Yeah, he can drain an entire soul level from you. That's brutally punishing, which is amazing for a game like this, and fair considering it's bright and noticeable tell. In terms of difficulty, you get to use the peak of your kit against his, and it shows. Your damage is sizable, though he does greatly resist magic if you use that to make it this far. Thankfully, I relied on bone smashing, but even still, his damage is erratic from small flurries that add up to devastating near one-shots. His pressure is almost constant, requiring healing and damage windows to be earned. It's a fantastic battle, one of the hardest, and a phenomenal climax before the twisted ending. Before we get to our final boss, I have a few honorable mentions. This time around, I decided to stick solely to bosses with named health bars, but I'd be remiss if I didn't shout out some old favorites. First, the dragons. Aero Simulator 2020 is still garbage, it's not that hard, and boy is it boring. 
I can at least commend the dragons in Remake for having clearly defined fire, making deaths due to obscure range far less likely, not that killing them puts you in any real danger. Finally, Old King Doran. Here's a recommendation, don't fuck with Doran unless you want him to give you the pipe. This dude has been waiting behind a door for god knows how long while his successors let demons run rampant through his homeland. Also, he can let whoever opened the door beat him mercilessly. Or not. He asks for it. He's begging you to thrash him, slash him, and bash him to show your worth. But if you dare to give him more than he asks for, you are in for a world of one-shots across an HP bar that makes every single health bar in this game look like tissue paper. If you are ever invaded by someone with Doran's armor, run my friend. They are a god gamer the likes of which you've never seen. Though you may not need power so divine, for my number one hardest boss in Demon Souls, the Maneater's demands aren't far from it. The Gargoyles of 3-2 have always been a bit brain dead. This hasn't changed in Remake. Are you gonna attack me? Oh, nope, he's decided to live a more honest Gargoyle life. Maneater is like if this gargoyle became a boss. His animations and tells are very limited. I'm not really sure what he's doing. Quick bow, then charge? Uh, okay, I can get that. Hit him and, uh... Get down here so we can finish this, you coward! Okay, never mind, you can stay up there. Then I melt him, and he's off into oblivion. I have no clue where he went. Oh, there he is! Then I get dunk punch dunk punch, and dead. He can fire a sound wave, charge, fly around, hiss and piss I guess. This thing hurts and tracks like a DS2 turnstile turtle. Racing to kill the first before dealing damage with the second feels like a must so you don't get double bullied. My damage was plenty high, but it didn't matter in the face of dunk punch. Oh, and don't forget that when facing two powerful enemies with knockback on a tight bridge, you're liable to succumb to the true hardest boss, gravity. His offense is so regular that you don't get a whole lot of downtime, unless he has a sudden brain fart, which is hard to predict. In fact, sometimes he strings attacks together so quickly you get stun locked. Granted, I was in the nude due to my giant heavy sword and lack of equipped girth, but still. Patience is required, going near the middle of the map helps, and a dose of luck with their potato AI works wonders. Still, sometimes that can work against you with them suddenly yeeting into an instant attack that blasts you into oblivion. The mixture of trying to read their attacks, dodge effectively while staying afloat on the bridge, finding windows for your own offense, doubling the trouble for an endurance fight on speed, and their hefty damage makes this hands down my choice for the hardest boss in Demon's Souls Remake. But of course, that's just my opinion. What did you think of today's ranking? Let us know in the comments below. I feel like I've been pretty heavy on top 10s and rankings lately while well, light on the essays, so I'm gonna take time cooking up something special in lieu of a quality ranking for Demon's Souls Remake. Subscribe to stay tuned for that and more, and leave a like if you enjoyed today's video. And of course, I wanna thank you for watching today. Much love to you, and I'll see you in the next video.